via negativa. It's not a term that I usually come across in my regular pastoral rounds. Via negativa. So I was, I got to tell you, I was delighted and surprised when it came up this week in a conversation with a person who actually is in the room. I'm not going to look that way. I'm going to look straight back right now because I haven't asked him if I can tell his name, so I won't. But it was, it was really kind of cool. He said, oh, yeah, via negativa. And, and that was a good thing. It's a term that has been sometimes used in Christian theology um, to, to think about what God is like by focusing on what God isn't like. The big term for that is apophatic theology. You, you don't need to know that. <laughs> but it's, but it's kind of cool just to, just to have it there. Um, that is sometimes, you know, God, if God is that being who is by definition beyond human comprehension, then we know that we cannot say fully what God is like. But we could get closer by by thinking about what things God cannot possibly be and be God. That's via negativa. And you could play with that in your mind. And if you get bored, just go ahead and write some notes down. Um, what God cannot be like if God is God, according to the scripture. That's via negativa. It's a, sometimes it's a, it's a clearer way to get a picture of what something is by calling attention to what it cannot possibly be. So for example, how, how would you describe a perfect day? <laughs> I bet if we sort of went around the room or had small groups around what's a perfect day, we would all have an image of what a perfect day is, but it might be different from one another. We'd have different ways to think about what a perfect day might be. Or how, how do you name all the things that you want to do or experience in your life. Fear negativa allows you to take sort of the opposite approach. Try, try, for example, listing the stuff that you are really certain that you don't want to do. If you list those things, or think about all the things that would make your life terrible, and to the greatest degree that you have ability, try to avoid those, then you might get closer to the kind of life that you want to experience. I, I think Jesus is using a little bit of via negativa in today's gospel. I mean, there's a lot of negative stuff there. Did you notice it? I mean, there's demons, there's exclusion, there's stumbling blocks, there's drowning with a millstone. There's self-amputation of hands and feet. There's gouging out of eyes. There's a never-dying worm and an unquenchable fire and insipid salt. And every one of you said, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> I was listening. Hmm. You know, maybe... Maybe Jesus is a bit frustrated for the slowness of the disciples to understand. We don't really know the texture and the backdrop. As I've said many times before, I'd love to have the soundtrack. I'd love to have the tone of voice, but you can't get that. You have to sort of read that in there. But maybe Jesus was frustrated because the disciples just didn't seem to get it. He's talking about welcoming others like these little children and they are talking about who's the greatest. He's talking about the last shall be first and they're thinking that the first ought to be first. <laughs> right? I mean, that's the context that Pastor Katie walked us through last week. Um, maybe Jesus is frustrated. We don't know. But whatever the reason... Jesus' use of this negative, even gruesome imagery gives us a glimpse, I think, via negativa, of the church, of his dreams. What is the church of his dreams given this story in the gospel? 
I mean, you, you know the story. I mean, they're still in the house. It's almost dancing music. Um, for all we know, they're still at the same place we left them last week. And if you remember, Jesus had just taken a little child and put, it, put that child, him or her, on his lap. And there on the lap, Jesus perhaps has that child still when the story unfolds. And John, John, perhaps trying to process what Jesus had just said about welcoming this child, as Pastor Katie told us last week, this, this one who, not in our day, that would seem so sweet, but this person at the margins of society that was seen as the lowest of the lowest. And perhaps wanting to test that or try to process it, John asks this, makes this statement, doesn't ask a question. He actually has a bold statement that he makes in response. He reports rather boldly their highbrowed kind of exclusive way of dealing with a freelance exorcist who is using Jesus' name to cast out demons. I mean, can you imagine John there? Surely... Surely Jesus doesn't mean we should welcome them. And yet, Jesus' response is quite counter to what John expects. Jesus ties right back to whoever welcomes me, welcomes a little child who welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. The Church of Jesus dreams, first of all, in these first couple of verses, is a community of acceptance and embrace. Jesus says, do not stop him. It's interesting to me that there's something going on here among those disciples because, because it, you notice that John doesn't say that he wasn't following you. He said he wasn't following us. Already, it had become a closed, cultish, sectarian kind of movement even before it's even launched. But Jesus says, do not stop this one. The disciple community that Jesus imagines is one, is one where unnecessary barriers and prejudices are broken down rather than lifted up. It's a dream that, that encourages broad-minded attitudes toward those who do things differently, even in the name of Jesus. Oh, don't get nervous. It's not watering things down. Later in chapter 13 and other places, Jesus is going to say, yes, there will be false prophets among you, but that's really not yours to adjudicate. Yours is to accept is to create a culture, to create an ethos, a culture of acceptance and respect and cooperation among all those who do ministry in his name. I mean, you know, it could have been, I mean, it could have been a fundamentalist Baptist or a smells and bells Episcopalian or a don't sit down in church ever at all Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox. Weird. And Jesus says, don't stop them. Rather, embrace and celebrate that good things are happening in my name. I mean, just think. Just think. Just, just imagine. Just, just dream what cooperation, real cooperation could mean even in our region. Even in the city of Rochester, if we were to stop duplicating ministries and instead band together with soup kitchens and provision of clothing and children's programming and youth programming and senior adult ministry, and, and the list goes on and on and on, but no, no, no. We've actually, we can actually do it better in our way. And we seem to all think like that. Wasn't it C.S. Lewis somewhere in screw tape letters who said that all the devil has to do is get the Christians fighting among one another? 
and we don't really have to do anything else. A community of acceptance and embrace. We're called by Jesus. Several things sort of unfold in these early two or three verses. We're called by Jesus to see the undeniable influence of Jesus' name. Verse 39 says, Do not stop, and for no one who does a deed of power in my name will soon afterward speak evil of me. Just, just planting that seed will soften a heart. Just doing, just sheer goodness will begin to draw people toward the God who said everything created is good. It can't not. And there's goodness everywhere. Maybe you saw that, that uh, recent news blurb about, about a 70-some-year-old woman who fell while hiking in a remote area and broke bones, and, and other hikers came along, a young, strapping young man who put her on his back and hiked all the way down. She will not soon forget that act of goodness, which every act of goodness reflects the goodness of God. And of the people who are created in God's image. We're called not only to see the undeniable influence of Jesus' name and acts of goodness, we're called also to resist categorizations of who's in and who's out of us and them. Whoever's not against us is for us. And we're called to recognize the sheer goodness of simply seeing a need and responding to it. A cup of cold water. No gospel lesson. A cup of cold water. <laughs> no, there's nothing wrong with the gospel lesson. I, I like it. <laughs> this is what I do. But a cup of cold water is sufficient when that's what the context calls for in the name of Jesus. And by the way, we will never get it all right. All of our judgments cannot on this side of the new creation ever be pristine. So it's always better to err on the side of risk than it is the side of judgment. Jesus calls for a community of acceptance and embrace. He also calls in the next set of verses, that middle set, for a community of attentiveness and care. The disciple community that Jesus imagines is one in which helping others along the way, especially the most vulnerable, the little ones, he says here, perhaps holding more closely that little child, A community in which, in which helping others along the way is as natural as the desire to live itself. You don't want to have a millstone strapped around your neck and be thrown into the water. You, you want to live. The word there that's translated stumble is the word scandalon, as many of you know. It was, a, it was originally a, a trap, an animal, tra a trap for catching animals which then became to be used in a metaphorical way for a pitfall to trip someone up to cause a downfall or an entrapment, some kind of a pitfall. And in this context, it's here that's something we can do to ourselves as well. And so here, Jesus encourages, in this passage, a, a twofold attentiveness and care, first to the needs of others, particularly the little ones among us. And who are they? Well, sure. It's the little children, but it's also the children, put quotes around it, and we have many children in our culture, among us in our spaces, and we have others who, are, who exist on the margins and who are pushed out by others, and those are the particular ones, Jesus says, an attentiveness to the needs of others, those who are not seen or honored or respected or cared for are the particular ones the disciple community is called to care for. 
But then there's also in this twofold attentiveness, not only to the needs of others, but also to the influence of my own words and actions that Jesus is calling for. If you cause another one of these to sin, to fall, your actions, my actions. So this community that Jesus dreams of via negativa with his disciples there in the home is a community of acceptance and embrace. It's a community of attentiveness and care. And it's a community of integrity and authenticity. I can't shake these last verses, 43 through 50, where Jesus, underneath it, in a positive way, is talking about a community of integrity in which integrity is the quintessential mark of one's daily living, of the community's way of being. It's not only a welcoming posture toward others out there. It's not only a consistent attentiveness to the most vulnerable, but it's also an attention to ourselves. Your hand your foot, your eye. It, it might be a good moment just to stop and look at your hands. And reflect on the things that those hands have done. In the name of Christ. And in the name of anger and selfishness. See, the trials and the temptations and the secret opportunities of life are many and no one is immune. Jesus says later on that everyone will be salted with fire. Our hands, the things that we do, our feet, the places that we go, our eyes, the things that we allow our minds to see and enter into the recesses of our imagination and our thought. And we, we are responsible. You see, Jesus' words here provide a pretty concise blueprint for, for integrity of the people of God. Let me just list a few of them. First, in everything, take a long view rather than a short view. Notice the little word better that's repeated four times over. It would be better for you if, it would be better for you if, it would be better for you if. See, that's a term of discernment. <laughs> Discerning what's better and what's not good. What's least good. What's less good. So we ask about the implications of every decision and its impact on the future because everything, everything we do has consequences for good or ill. And what a beautiful thing that everything that we do has the potential to connect time and eternity in the name of Jesus. In everything, take a long view. Secondly, recognize that all of life is lived coram Deo, in the presence of God. That while others may not know, there's nothing God does not see and recognize and know. And thirdly, insist that your own practices, insist for yourself that your own practices and choices match your deepest Identity. Is what I do with my hands and my feet and my eyes, my mind, truly match the person I deeply long to be? Several of you are thinking about and praying about and have already signed up for practicing the way groups, which is simply a primer or an introduction to a lifelong discipleship to Jesus. 
It's the one apprenticeship that doesn't end with a certificate. <laughs> right? When I was 12 or 13 years of age, I had a required apprenticeship because I was in my father's family to learn the electrical contracting trade. But that apprenticeship ended <laughs> when I took the test and got my journeyman electrician's card. But this apprenticeship, this apprenticeship goes on because I will never fully be like Jesus. And this apprenticeship with it to Jesus is one of simply being with Jesus, being with a master, the master in this case, of becoming like the master and doing as the master did. And then, lastly, on this concise blueprint for personal integrity, remember that God's desire is for life. It's a gruesome passage. It's got gory stuff in it. But notice the key words three times over. It's better for you to, to, to what? To enter life. To enter life. To enter the kingdom of God. Jesus' desire, God's desire for us is life and life to the fullness, full, its fullest. And the thief comes only to kill and to destroy. Gehenna is the word, as you know, translated for hell. It's that ravine south of Jerusalem that became a garbage dump and was used as a garbage dump in the, in the first century, smoldering garbage. But it was only a garbage dump because it was the historic site of Canaanite child sacrifice to the god Moloch. And that ground so desecrated could be used for nothing other than the hellish dump of all the refuse of life. In contrast to that, Jesus says, enter life. Enter life however, however wounded you need to be to be in life. No one makes it through unwounded, friends. We will limp our way to eternity. but we will have life. And so by the use of via negativa, I think Jesus paints a pretty clear picture of the church of his dreams. But it's not just a picture. Yogi Berra once quipped, <laughs> There's no difference between theory and practice. But in practice, there is. You didn't get it. <laughs> There's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. That's what he said. And I think he's right. It'll take you a minute. You can get it when you get home. But here, here it is. It's, it's one thing. It's one thing to name all of these things as a part of a biblical theology of the church. or to hear, it, hear these things in a sermon. But friends, it's quite another to live them out in practice. Practicing the way of Jesus to embody Jesus' dream in our lives, in our church, and on behalf of the world that God loves so much. May it be so in our lives. Amen.